Home Minister Mr. P. Chidambaram, who will give his keynote address. Honorable Minister, Home Minister Mr. P. Chidambaram, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce the inaugural keynote speaker of the conclave, Mr. P. Chidambaram, the man you see dressed in immaculately starched white, is our real action hero. He's the chosen one to save India from the twin evils of Maoism and Jihad, and it looks like the minister is succeeding. He came to the bloated Moribund Home Ministry in the immediate aftermath of the 2611 Mumbai attack. His arrival in the ministry marked a cultural shift. And he immediately set out to do what his predecessors could not do in decades. The first step towards a terror-proof, safer India, he was quick to realize was a total overhaul of the rusty security apparatus. It required a certain amount of ruthlessness and relentlessness. Mr. Chidambaram has both in abundance. So he's already set deadlines. National Counterterrorism Center by the year end, National Intelligence Grid by 2011, and one year later the Crime and Criminal Tracking System. He is someone you always take seriously because he always means business. He says what he means, and he means what he says, a quality rarely seen in the political fraternity. He also does what he says, which is even rarer. Maybe it began in his early days as a young communist who raged against capitalism, but he soon realized the folly of his radicalism. He probably fits into that Churchillian description of the evolution of the political idealist. If you're not a communist at the age of 20, you do not have a heart, and if you're still a communist at the age of 40, you do not have a head. Well, he definitely has a head. He went to the Harvard Business School. He already had degrees in science and law, a formidable combination indeed. And that may explain his clarity of thought, the sharpness of his argument, and the logic of his analysis. When he came back, he started life as a trade union lawyer, and his best work was challenging, challenging the way the government worked. The experience was a learning curve that made him realize that the Indian system was being crippled by protectionism and created rent seekers. The lawyer began his ministerial career in 1984 in the Rajiv Gandhi government. Even today, you can't miss the lawyer in him. He is not one to lose an argument. He was at his best, his argumentative best during his stints as finance minister. Mr. Chidambaram holds the record of having worked as finance minister in the most difficult condition, coalitions in the history of India. In 1997, the United Front government was supported by the left parties that did not dissuade him from ushering in reforms and presenting what is even today called the Dream Budget, which is the biggest tax reform initiative by any finance minister. He cut layers of rates, created a system to track non-taxpayers and rewarded honest taxpayers with lower tax rates. His tenure as finance minister between 2004 and 2009 was again in a difficult coalition that included the left. He delivered a tandulkar like record of three successive years of 9 plus percent GDP growth and the lowest fiscal deficit. No history of India's liberalization can be written without a Chidambaram chapter. Today, he's the right man for the worst of times. The Maoists were essentially sub-rural terrorists with revolutionary pretense, have declared war on the Indian state. Mr. Chidambaram realizes the enormity of the threat from the enemy within, and he knows he cannot afford to be sentimental. He will talk, but only to the terrorists disarmed. He refuses to be the representative of the soft state. We have with us, ladies and gentlemen, the man who makes you sleep sounder. So may I present Mr. P.C. Chidambaram to deliver his keynote address. Thank you.
Mr. Arun Puri, delegates to the India Today Conclave, ladies and gentlemen, good morning to all of you. Just taking from what uh, Arun said towards the end, I hope you had a sound sleep last night. It's time to wake up and smell the coffee. South Asia today is perhaps the most difficult place in the world. It is the epicenter of terrorism. It's also the epicenter of Maoism. Being the largest country in South Asia, largest in terms of size, population, as well as the size of the economy, all countries in South Asia look to India either as a friend or as a foe. Seen from a strategic point of view, India holds the key to political and economic stability in South Asia. And our responsibility is great because of our democratic and secular credentials underpinned by steady progress in the socio-economic sectors. India is seen as a friend by countries which wish to take the same path, democracy, secularism, pluralism and inclusive growth. India is seen as a threat by some countries for a variety of reasons. It's hardly necessary for me to list the countries or the reasons. It therefore falls upon India to disprove the tag that it is a threat to any neighbor and send the message that it is ready to become the engine of change and the leader of economic development in the region. The most serious threat arises from jihadi terrorism. It's unfortunate that the 21st century has seen a throwback to the days of the Crusades. It appears that the world is getting divided into Islamic nations and non-Islamic nations. That is sad. It also portends a very grim future for countries which have both people professing the Islamic faith as well as a very large number of people professing other faiths. The best example is India. Any conflict between Islam and other religions has its greatest and most deleterious impact on countries like India. We are victims of jihadi terrorism. The epicenter of jihadi terrorism is Afghanistan, Pakistan. There are elements in other countries such as Bangladesh, 
Sri Lanka and now even elements in the Maldives. While we are obliged to take steps to strengthen our security system, we are doing that and we will continue to do that. It is important that people belonging to all faiths in India learn to live in peace and harmony. Jihadi terrorism may not exactly be the flip side of communal violence, but communal violence, communal disharmony creates an environment where jihadi terrorism can flourish. If the poor Indian Muslim boy, or sometimes even a girl, does not believe that he or she can live in India with equal rights, equal status, dignity, professing his or her faith, and be able to aspire to a life of reasonable prosperity, many of them are likely to be recruited to the cause of jihadi terrorism. It's therefore very important that for a country like India, we ensure that people belonging to all faiths are able to live together in peace and harmony, with equality, with dignity, and are able to share the benefits of inclusive growth. Having said that, let me say that just because we are able to find a way in which people can live in peace and harmony it does not mean that jihadi terrorism will come to an end. The jihadi terrorist today has set before himself or herself enemies all over the world. Israel, the United States, Russia, countries of Europe, even if the cause be that a newspaper in a country publishes a cartoon, writers, and even China. South Asia, therefore, has a duty to work together to put an end to jihadi terrorism. As far as India is concerned, Bangladesh until some time ago emerged as a major hub of terrorist groups targeting India and an important launching pad for jihadi violence. It became a transit point for terrorists to be exfiltrated out of India through Bangladesh to Pakistan and to be infiltrated into India through Bangladesh. Likewise, Nepal became another point of exfiltration and infiltration. Recently, there have been attempts to find safe havens in Maldives, in Sri Lanka, but these have been sporadic. It's therefore very important that we work with all our neighbors, and I'm happy that we have received, after Sheikh Hazina's government took over, splendid cooperation from Bangladesh. Likewise, we have received splendid cooperation from Bhutan, and more recently from Sri Lanka. We still have to find a way to work with Nepal and Myanmar, but I'm sure over a period of time our efforts on this behalf also will succeed.